Hi everyone, this is going to be the math review. We're going to cover a bunch of topics that will be useful for us the rest of the quarter. Uh, but we're not going to do much direct machine learning stuff in here, but just cover topics in vectors and matrices and calculus and calculus with matrices and vectors. Okay. Uh, if for some reason you either are very comfortable with this kind of stuff, you can feel free to skip this uh, lecture, or if you're not finding my version of this material very useful, then please you should seek out some of the videos that I've linked to in the syllabus from three blue, one brown. They do a really good job of showing you the basics of linear algebra and calculus. They're a dedicated YouTube channel for math. So consider taking a look at that uh, if my exposition isn't working for you. All right, let's do a very fast recap of uh, things that we were doing at the end of the last uh, lecture. So supervised learning is what we're doing in this whole quarter. And the framework that we learned about the last time is that we're trying to do some kind of prediction task. We're trying to either make a decision or come up with a real value that accurately reflects what our data are telling us to get out of this result. Um, so, for instance, if we're trying to make a decision, is something a bird or not a bird based upon measurements of this animal? Or we're trying to get a predicted price for something given features that represent that something. Okay, in order to do this, we need to have a bunch of data. And we, along with that data, we have to have some sort of label to go with each element in a training data set. Okay, we need to know what's the right answer for a bunch of data so that we can use that data to fix up our machine learning algorithm to make the right answers on a completely different data set. So we're going to call these two data sets training and testing. And the training data set has pairs of objects in it, x of i, which is a vector representing the input, and y sub i, which is the correct label for each one of those elements in the training set. Now, in this case, we're saying that the training set has n elements in it. Okay, the testing set has input vectors in it, and we're trying to predict the proper output y sub i for each one of those u elements. Right? It is very helpful if you do know the proper y sub i for each one of those elements, if you do have labeled data for them, because then you can make a judgment on how good you did on the training set. All right. Um, the other thing that we just need to briefly mention is there was another video which, uh, where I used a Jupyter notebook to show you a little bit about features and input data and how you can transform input data into features that are more useful for a particular task that you're doing with that data. So if you haven't already seen that video, head on back. Well, into the vectors. So a vector is simply a directional magnitude, a direction and magnitude in one in the sense of uh, writing it down in a bunch of numbers, right? So we're going to write down numbers that represent a direction and a magnitude. So here is vector A. We can represent it as starting at the origin and going to this point here. And this point here can be represented in terms of these variables A. So if A1 tells you how far along you are in X1 and A2 tells you how far along this point is up axis x2, and a3 is like an intercept term. Right now we're drawing these vectors as going through the origin, but if we had the same vector, the same direction and magnitude, we could also put it up here and have it go from this point up here, right? And to do that we would need uh, a bias term to, to move that vector away from the origin, right? So we have vectors a and b. We can, of course, add vectors a and b together, right? 
So if we just take vector b and we translate it in space and move it up to a, we can see that the operation a plus b is just that stacking produces this vector here, a plus b. And numerically, we just add together the three elements of the vector. Okay. So let's show you how we use such a thing inside a machine learning context. We're going to use the decision boundary example from the last lecture. So we want to draw a line here that optimally separates birds in this feature space from non-birds on the other side of that boundary. And we can say what happens when uh, we draw a boundary. We're drawing it with this uh, vector x. x is showing us the line that the boundary lies on. Okay. What happens when we have a point which we will call x, which lies on the decision boundary. Well, every x that lies on the decision boundary, the dot product of w that defines the boundary and x is defined to be 0. So any point on this line, the dot product of w and that x dot point, wherever it is, is 0. This is just a bunch of ways to write that in similar notations, that the dot product can be written this way, this way, this way. These are all equivalent notations. So, and w is the normal direction of the line. w defines the normal vector. The, sorry, the, um, the projection defines the normal vector. Okay? So what if we have a point x1 which is not on the decision boundary. Well, so this is the vector x1 going from origin to that point. And the dot product is the projection of x1 onto this normal vector w. All right? So that normal vector w tells you how far up away from the decision boundary this point is okay so x1 dot product with this vector w is the measurement of the perpendicular uh, displacement of x1 off of the decision boundary how is this useful in machine learning well you know if birds are over here and non-birds are over here things that are kind of sort of mostly birds are going to lie near the decision boundary and things which are further off the decision boundary you might have more confidence potentially in your prediction okay so maybe ostriches and um, funny things like platypi and raptor dinosaurs all lie closer to the boundary than uh, many other kinds of animals all right so Again, I'm going to mention that there are some YouTube videos on 3 blue, 1 brown, like this one, which are going to give you good introductions to this if what I've just said to you doesn't make much sense. All right. So if you would like to, we can use this example with particular numbers, OK? Um, so one thing is that w, this normal vector, is often represented as a unit vector. That is that, whoops, let me go backwards. That is that um, the L2 norm of w is equal to 1. What is the L2 norm? The L2 norm is simply the Pythagorean theorem, right? It's the square root of the sum of squares of the vector's elements, okay? So that sums up to 1, which means the magnitude of the vector is 1. So if we know that one of these dimensions is 1.2 times the other, we can plug that in here. We can add up the square root of the sum of squares, and that gives you this magnitude, 
So we know that this is going to be 1.2 squared plus 1 squared, right? Has got to be equal to 1, and so we can solve this, these equations this way. All right. So again, what is the significance of the dot product here? So the dot product is a way of thinking about the projection of one vector onto another. Okay, So the dot product represents the way in which vector A, how much of vector A lies along the direction that vector B is traveling. And the thing is, is that is a, that is a commutative property. A dot B is the same as B dot A. How much of A lies on B is the same as how much of B lies on A. So the, you can think of it in terms of uh, like shadows in a, um, in a sundial, okay? So let me turn back on my video deo here. So if you have vector A and vector B, okay, and they're orthogonal, then the projection of A, if you imagine the sun being right overhead, is zero. It just disappears, right? If they're, oops, yay for video. I'm all backwards on video. All right, so if things are near collinear, then the projection of one onto the other is basically the whole length of the vector, right? So we get larger numbers when things are close to collinear, and we get smaller numbers when things are perpendicular. All right. And you're seeing here again just all the notations. Uh, so a dot b is the same as b dot a, or you can do it with the transpose or the, the, um, the angle brackets version of that. So this is a similarity that the dot product is going to uh, show us. So if the two vectors a and b are unit vectors, if they're well aligned, then it's going to be 0 when they're orthogonal and 1 when they have the largest value. Okay, But that's only true if a and b are unit vectors. If they're not unit vectors, things get more complicated. Okay, There's no nice relationship like that. So in that case, we might want to use a slightly different metric. And we'll talk about that in a second. But let's, let's give you a numerical example right off the bat. Okay, let's say we're going to try to categorize our animals, birds or no birds, by features like, does it fly? Does it lay eggs? What is its weight? Okay, so we can represent those by a vector. So sparrow becomes this, and chipmunk becomes that, and here's bat. Now what is this representation? All right, so flying is a category, and it comes in two flavors. True or false, yes or no. And the first two elements of the column vector are flying. So if it flies, it's going to have a 1 here and a 0 there. This is called a one-hot encoding. Every possibility of the category has got its own position in the vector, and only one of these can be active. Okay, so you can have a one zero, or you can have a zero one for a chipmunk which doesn't fly, but you cannot have a one one or a zero zero in those positions in a one-hot encoding. This we'll talk a lot more about one-hot encodings later, but for right now, just Let's look at these as numbers that are representing these animals. Okay? So, right. What happens when we dot product these animal vectors? Well, we find that sparrows and chipmunks are not very similar. Sparrows and bats are, and chipmunks and bats are remarkably similar too. And it turns out it's, you know, they, they share the common no eggs. So there I've got 0, 1 here, 0, 1 here. So that's why they come out numerically that way. Now again, these vectors here are not unit vectors. If you uh, square these numbers here and add them up, 
and take the square root, the number is not going resulting is not going to be one. Okay. So, well, if we want to deal with vectors like that, that don't, they are not normalized to a unit vector length, then we can do something a little bit different. We can use something called the cosine similarity. The cosine similarity starts with the dot product. Okay, so the projection of A onto B is this right here, right? That is the dot product, A dot B. Well, as you can see, this is a triangle, and the cosine of theta is, uh, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So the adjacent is here, it's the dot product, and now we need to normalize by the hypotenuse, and we can get we can get rid of the, that by dividing by the magnitudes of vectors a and b. And these are, once again, the L2 norms of those vectors. Okay. So, in this formulation, it doesn't matter that vectors a and b are not unit vectors. We're going to get a measurement which is essentially, are they pointing in the same direction? What is the angle here, theta? When that angle is small, the cosine term is going to be very large. It's going to be approaching one as the, cos uh, the cosine of zero approaches, sorry, the cosine of theta approaches one as theta approaches zero, right? It doesn't matter how long A is. A, a dot B only projects onto the vector here, and if A was a big long vector like B, A dot B would be a much bigger number, right? But we don't care about magnitude in the cosine similarity. We're only getting the relationship of angle here. When A is perpendicular to B, then this theta term becomes goes close to 90 degrees, and at that point, the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So as we approach perpendicular, the similarity of the two vectors goes to zero. All right, maybe it's a good moment to check your understanding of the cosine similarity. So yes, indeed, the cosine similarity of zero indicates two samples being the least similar to each other. All right, so what if we apply the cosine similarity to our animals? Same vectors, we find a little bit of a different result here, right? So once again, chipmunk and bat and sparrow and bat are um, reasonably similar to each other, but sparrow and chipmunk is not a very good similarity. The numbers are different this time around, and at this point, the magnitude of these doesn't really matter. So feature scaling is another important factor. Remember that during my video I showed on with the Jupyter Notebook uh, doing feature transformations of inputs, we talked about the fact that some of these variables may not be suited to a particular technique you're trying to apply, right? If something really, if a technique really needs it to be normal and it's not normal data, well, then you're gonna have to deal with that. You're gonna have to transform things. So any kind of similarity metric, when you stretch one of the variables, one of the directions, if you stretch it out, it's gonna start to dominate everything you're asking about here with a similarity metric. So let's take a look here. Um, what if we change the, um, the weights from pounds to grams, okay? So these represent the same weight, right? But instead of fractions of a pound, we now have large numbers here 
10 or 100 or 1,000 times bigger than the numbers used to be in terms of numeric weight. That means this number here is 100 times more impactful in measuring the vector similarity than this one over here. Okay? Previously, flies and eggs had an impact of one versus something that was a fraction of a pound here. So these were dominant terms in determining similarity. Now the weight is the main thing, okay? And it, and it just obliterates everything else. So this is a problem of feature scaling. When you have features where one of them is a dominant, then we need to perhaps rescale them to all be in the same uh, overall numeric impact, okay? So, um, so if we scale these vectors, if we scale each uh, entry in these vectors, then we can get rid of this problem. If we just do like we did in the video where we turn it into a normal distribution at mean zero and the weights of chipmunk and so forth are just, um, you know, how many standard deviations they are away from the mean of all the animals, then that gets rid of this problem. Okay. So just to recap all this, dot product is a similarity measure between two vectors and it includes their magnitudes. Two vectors that are most, most close to each other are going to have large values of dot product. And if they are normalized, then the dot product goes between zero and one. If they are not uh, normalized vectors, then the dot product can take on other values. Cosine similarity, however, is always between 0 and 1, and it only cares about the direction of the vectors. It ignores their magnitudes. Okay? So in all cases, 0 is least similar, and 1 is most similar. So again, we can, uh, if, you, if this became confusing for you, please check out uh, the YouTube 3 blue, 1 brown. Now, we're going to head onwards to matrices. Let's, uh, let's see if I can appear in the corner here to spice up some math. So we need to remember the way in which we were organizing the data. We're going to have a set of data to represent the training inputs, right? So we have a vector x of i of inputs and a set, a label y sub i. We're going to have n of those is going to be our training set. And we're either going to be uh, saying something is or is not Right? It is category A or category B. Um, in this case, let's imagine that this data here, which has uh, health metrics on it, right? it's got age and weight and height. Maybe our positive and negative is something like, say, high blood pressure. Okay, So does somebody have high blood pressure? Yes, then they're positive. Their y, plus, their y is plus 1. And otherwise, they're negative. Y is minus 1. Okay, so that's the nature of our inputs. What are we going to do with them? Well, we can represent them as a matrix. Okay, so the matrix X transforms those inputs. Okay, so here is the age column. Here is a one hot encoding of male or female. That's male, male, female. Okay, weight and height. Right, we can encode the y's, the outputs, right? And let's just assume that whatever algorithm we're using to classify has a, vec a vector w, which represents the parameters, which is what we're using to say, okay, we're going to make predictions now, okay? So when we have a new x, something coming in, 
we're going to multiply it. We're going to do the, the matrix multiplication x times w. And that's going to give us our predicted value y. OK? So how does this work? Well, just a reminder of how basic vector and matrix multiplication work. A times B, when you have a column vector and a row vector, make a scalar, OK, as long as the, uh, the size of those vectors is the same, right? So if A is length 3 and B is length 3, then a column, sorry, a row times a column makes a scalar. So with all matrix math, it's, it's the fact that the first uh, of the two is going to tell you how many rows you have, and the second of the two is going to tell you how many columns you have. So we have one row and one column. That means we have a one by one matrix answer. So it's going to be a scalar. OK, it's important to note that matrix math is not commutative. OK, A by B, A B is not the same as B A in matrix multiplication. OK, because when you did B, you would get three rows, right? and three columns. So that means the resulting matrix is three by three. OK. Again, the first one determines how many rows the answer is going to have. The second one determines how many columns. All right. So when we do things with matrices, uh, it works. This it works the same way. OK, it's not just vectors. So the matrix product is defined as this is. I don't want to go into the details because this is doing this on the iPad is a terrible, terrible thing. Again, if you are not familiar with how this works, I do recommend checking out the, uh, the three blue, one brown. OK? OK. So we've done matrices in a quick review. Calculus is the next thing. And then after that, we're going to do calculus with matrices. All right. And that'll kind of close out our math. So we know that anything which, so with calculus, if you're going to, uh, you're going to look at calculus for the first time with me, you're in trouble, right? So the fundamental things are with derivatives is that the f derivative of anything with respect to something else has got a fixed set of patterns, right? The derivative of y with respect to x in this case is just the constant a, right? The derivative of x squared something becomes 2x, right? There is a fundamental pattern that we drop a power and we uh, transfer out any constants, OK? So with functions like this, the uh, 